From Fairfax, Virginia, this is Out of the Past with Chuck Langdon and Lee Shepard, an in-depth discussion with some of the most fascinating people of our time, many of them with strong area connections. Now, today's Out of the Past. Hello and welcome again to Out of the Past. Have you ever wondered why some radio stations have only one broadcast tower and others have three in a row? <laughs> and have you ever wondered what happens to the announcer when lightning strikes the tower? We're going to ask our guest, Granville Clink, and also with us is Lee Shepard. And we're continuing a discussion that we started last week about microphones and the history of broadcasting in uh, this area. I'm just so excited because this is, this man is a legend in his own time, <laughs> and it's just incredible. Seven seven thirty seven, for example. What does that mean? My lucky numbers. Seven seven thirty seven. That's when I started at WJSV. Seventh of July, nineteen thirty seven. Wow. Seven is my one of my lucky numbers. You know, I, I I've always told people that, and, and to impress people, I told them. And, I, and it's true, I got into radio when I was 15 years old. But you got into radio when it was 15. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or thereabouts, yeah. that's close enough for government work. Yeah, that's right, yeah. But uh, uh, back to your original question, Chuck. I, uh, I've always wondered that, and this is the chance for me to find out. Why, <laughs> why is that? Uh, well, I can explain that. The, uh, the, the Federal Communications Commission uh, uh, took frequencies and divided them up to in, a, in, a, in a pile where one station would not interfere with another station. And that, that was all right for a while, but then when they started to get a lot of stations, they didn't have any place to put them. So they made the station erect a directional antenna. And that WTOP has a three-tower directional antenna system, and we protect a station in Minneapolis, KSTP. And at nighttime, the the uh, the usual pattern of our station will say, for generally speaking, it's kind of a big watermelon like this. So in the northwest at nighttime, we take the end of that watermelon and we pull it in like that, so it has a, a no end like that. So the the radiation in that direction protects KSTP. And KSTP does the same thing for us. So in between the two of us, we don't have all this monkey chatter between the two stations interfering with each other. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're, we're not the only directional. There's a lot of directional stations uh, on the band. And uh, they're, they're, their pattern is such that they are, they are patterned so as not to interfere with any other station. And we have a picture of you standing in front of the WTOP tower and those uh Oh, those towers are in the background. Oh, yeah. They're in front of the, tra uh, the transmitter. Right, in front of the building, right. yes, right. yes. And uh, that, uh, that directional system, uh, oh, through the years, we were, when we set that up, we were out in Wheaton. We still are, but there wasn't any... Uh, we were just out in the middle of nowhere. Fields, cows, crickets, snakes. And when Wheaton started to build up, every year we had to measure that system to see that that knoll was still there. The FCC required that. But when that start, the buildup started, we would find that this null had a spike in it here and one over here maybe, caused by re-radiation from the buildings that they were putting up between our measurements. And the power company put up a high line in front of the building. They widened the road. And that caused us a problem with the, with the radiation coming off guy wires and off the, off the, off the high voltage PEPCO lines. And so every year we had to readjust our, our system. And that was, we did that for five or six years, and then, of course, when the buildup kind of slowed down, well, we haven't had to readjust it recently, but uh, in, uh, if somebody puts up a 200-foot uh, apartment building somewhere near us, then that re-radiates back into our system. Mm. And the re-radiation will sometimes cancel part of our signal. Yes, Lee. You know, I remember something, Chuck, I think you were there at the, the time, and I was there in, in the early 60s. I remember uh, the story I know it's true because it happened in, when I was there. She opened her oven one morning, and it said, Good morning, this is Eddie Gallagher. <laughs> now, is that possible? Now, 
<laughs> is that possible? I know it is because I was there. I didn't. I, I wasn't there in her house to see see that happen. But could that happen? Yes, that's possible. We've had the station. We've had the people with their toasters also causing that problem, and. Uh, one, one, we had one uh, neighbor out there whose, whose bathroom fixture picked up the signal. And when he was shaving in the morning, he could hear a T.O.P. on his, uh, <laughs> the light over the sink, I think, or something like that. Well, <coughs> well I've heard of people right. picking up W.T.O.P. and his false teeth. Yes, yeah, we, we had a lady one time, and she came into my office and said that she, that she was hearing T.O.P. in her head, so he thought, well, she's a little nutty maybe, but... Uh, she said, no, I, I hear the station. So we took her out and walked her underneath the towers, and she heard, heard it loud and clear. She apparently had some dental work that acted as a diode or a detector in her jaw, and she was hearing the station in her teeth. <laughs> so, so that <laughs> is physically possible. Physi it doesn't happen too often, but this, this lady did. Uh, she did have that problem. A little rock and roll with breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so we suggested she go see her dentist, and maybe he could uh, do something to, uh, to, to kill that rectification in her teeth. Uh, now, oh, for listen to this segue. But without <laughs> microphones, there could be no. <laughs> so let's talk about microphones. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, we we had uh, in the earlier program talked about the. Uh, if you just repeat what they the names of those are. Yes. Uh, what, what's the, the uh, this microphone and this microphone are some of the original microphones, the very very high quality good microphones that were built by the Western Electric Company. Right in the early 20s and 30s and uh, uh, they, they were used on all of our outdoor uh, broadcasts and we used them on, like the, uh, the fireside chats and uh, in stadiums to pick up uh, uh, baseball and football and anything outside uh, we used these microphones also the, for the, uh, the dance bands we used to put on the air uh, from the various hotels we used uh, maybe three of these mics to pick up a dance band they, usually the direct the the band leader wanted one on the piano. We would put one in the, in the well of the piano. We had one for the announcer and the vocalist, and then one for the band. And sometimes they, we would use maybe four or five, but usually a three microphone mm -hmm. pickup of a band was pretty good. And then th this is, is a microphone. <coughs> oh, yes. And how, does it, how does it work? I mean, just briefly, you, you were... This, this is one of the very earliest type of microphones. This was built by Western Electric, and this is a, called a two-button carbon microphone. This is one of the early carbon microphones also built by Western Electric and this microphone is a uh, is not as sensitive as some of the others but it's a good microphone it, this has a diaphragm in here where, where, where the sound impinges on the diaphragm and then there's a little cup full of, of carbon granules and that vibration of the diaphragm sets up a voltage in these carbon granules and that is the actual voice and we take that off with a pair of wires and we put it through a preamplifier and that's a regular microphone. Now, I think I'd be more familiar with this if there were springs. Yes. This is, yeah, okay. There, there are springs that go with that, and, and if NBC had a big uh, uh, case with, with the holes around it, you've probably seen that. Uh -huh. And that microphone was, was set up in that case. And the reason for the springs was that this microphone was very sensitive to motion, so they had to put them on the, had to spring it so it wouldn't, so as to take the, any jarring would, would not be transmitted into the microphone and cause noise. Mm. Of course, this is the most familiar one now. I mean, I don't know why this is so popular now, uh, but for collectors, pay yeah. enormous sums of oh. money for mics like this. They do, It's huh? the old RCA 77D. Yeah, that's right. Well, that microphone originally sold for around $200, and we used to use them in our studios at Broadcast House, all of our studios had the uh, 77, it was a D, I think. But that is a very uh, good microphone in that it has three different patterns. It has a so-called figure of eight pattern, so two people can work on both sides of it. Or it has an omni pattern, which you can cluster around it. Or it has a piece of pie pattern, which uh, it has a, a, a null in one side. But usually we use either the, the omnidirectional or the figure eight pattern with people on, on opposite sides of the mic using it that way. Now, would this be as good as a, a microphone made today? Uh, oh, are I they making better microphones today? They're making them smaller. I don't know whether they're better or not. I, I think the, the, the theory of, of the operation of these, this type of microphone is very good, and you get, you get a wide band uh, frequency range out of these microphones. But, of course, the, the television industry doesn't want a big mic like that, and I don't blame them. 
sometimes blocks the performer's uh, face or something. And, 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 and then after that, the Alltech built a microphone, which they called a pencil mic, and you've probably seen it. We use them at TOP. About that long and very thin at the top and then like this. And the top of it is about, you know, about or big around as a nickel. And that was a good microphone for somebody to hold when they're singing. But you couldn't do that with one of those microphones. So they, they, they all have their place. But the television now requires that the microphone not be seen, if possible. So these microphones go out. Of course, radio still is going to use them. What other changes in, in radio technology has changed? Well, the, the, uh, the, the radio system as a whole was all live. We, we very seldom put on uh, recorded material unless it was uh, something that there was. We used to have a, a radio program where we went out and interviewed the ladies' clubs. We had a mobile unit. And we would run a long mic line into a home or wherever the meeting of the ladies' auxiliary happened to be. And Charlie Daly, and remember Charlie Daly, he was one of the, he was the uh, What's My Line MC. Charles Daly. Yeah. Yes. John Charles Daly. That's right. Well, we used to call him Charlie, and he was called Charlie, but now it was, when he got on television, it was John Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame him, it's a good name. Yeah. So uh, we would, uh, we would run the microphone into the wherever they were seated, and we would record a 15-minute program of the ladies' auxiliary, a church, or whatever it was. And uh, we would use uh, this microphone, and we would use one like that. It depended on what what acoustics were in the room that we were recording in. Sometimes it was a live room, sometimes it was a dead room. But uh, so you, you had to you had to be very careful with the with a pickup in in radio because that was your bread and butter. You had to have a very good radio pickup. And one of the problems we had in the earlier days was with, with Mr. Roosevelt, when the newsreels were around, we tried to beat them to the pickup because they, when they got there first, they put their mics in the best position right in front of Mr. Roosevelt. And we had to maybe put ours behind somewhere or somewhere as close as we could get it. But we got there first and we put one right in front of him. And I think that picture shows yes. the mic we'll right in front that. of him, CBS and NBC. So we, we had a little battle with the newsreels, but it was a friendly battle. Now, this could be very well be one that Roosevelt used. Yes, absolutely. Sure, yeah. But everyone's... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Both of these were, 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 could have been used by Mr. Roosevelt. That was 618. We had about a dozen of those mics split amount, uh, among about four or five of us. And we used to carry a, a regular kit with us with mics and uh, cables and uh, anything else we needed to, to put on the uh, broadcast, along with, a, with an amplifier, of course. But the, we, those mics uh, were, I'm sure both of them were used by Roosevelt. In fact, we, we don donated one of those microphones to the Smithsonian. There was a, a, a display of, of the Roosevelt Times down there uh, with, uh, with a picture of him. And we donated one of these microphones with CBS on it uh, to that display at the Smithsonian. I guess it's, it may be still there. I don't know. Did the feed go back then by radio, I mean, by telephone line? The what? The feed from the those yeah, press Yeah, a 5KC line, a 5-kilocycle five wide line, yes. We, all, we used 5-kilocycle telephone lines in most of the pickups. In other words, that was a 5-kilocycle five, five bandwidth, which uh, is good enough for most anybody. A lot of people can't hear to hit the 5 anyway. Of course, with, with FM, we've got to use a 15KC. But lots of people can't hear 15KC either. So... All of the telephone circuits we used in the early days were five kilocycles, 5 kc. And all your traveling was done by train. Yes. Uh, you say the Secret Service, maybe you said this on the last program, I forget, but I was amazed. The Secret Service didn't allow Roosevelt to fly? That's correct, yes. It was too dangerous in those days, and I, I guess I agree with them. <laughs> I like I liked to travel trains. We were, we could take a, a trip, trip maybe for 10 or 12 days at the time on the train. And one trip we started in Washington, we went up through New York State uh, and up, up around the uh, uh, boundary of Canada and down through Chicago and we wound up in West Virginia somewhere. He was visiting all of the, uh, the military uh, uh, places in those areas and he would talk to the military people. Sometimes we'd put him on the air. And uh, the Secret Service was always on the, on the train. Uh, I did one job uh, for Mr. Roosevelt in Cleveland. The, uh, the, uh, 
Democratic committee brought 45 minutes on the network. And I went out to, it was, it was 9 o'clock one evening, I've forgotten the day, but it was in November, and I went to the stadium in the morning, and uh, as I stepped out of the taxi cab, I was, I was, two men came up to me, and they, they introduced themselves right away as Secret Service men, and this was Cleveland, so I, they didn't know me and I didn't know them. So they made me unpack all of my equipment when I got it out of the taxi cab. I had four or five cases of equipment. They made me unpack it right on the sidewalk, and by that time we had gathered quite a little group around us watching, wondering what they were going to do to me. A little street take theater. Me, take me away in handcuffs or whatever. <laughs> So they, they, they say, we're awfully sorry we have to do this, but uh, this is our job, so we're going to have to check your equipment to make sure that you haven't got any whatever they're looking for. I don't know. In those days, there weren't any bombs around. But uh, the Secret Service was very, very uh, strict, and, and they, they, didn't, uh, they did a good job on the, on, on the, on the president. He, uh, he was well guarded in those days. Even on the train, one time I got turned around. I was headed for the, for the club car, and somehow I got turned around. And Mr. Roosevelt's car was always the first car on the train. And so I got, I went in the vestibule of this car. All of a sudden, this big man loomed up in front of me. He said, "Where are you going?" <laughs> I said, "I'm going to the club car." He said, "Turn around. You're going the wrong way." But we were laughed over something like that. There wasn't any problem. But uh, that that was uh, how how strict that there was. Uh, Secret Service men were. Now, if you'd seen anything like Eleanor throwing a vase at him, <laughs> would you have told about it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I never, Eleanor, I did, a lot, I did some pickups for Eleanor, too. She was a very nice lady. And in fact, both of them very nice people. They were very, very cooperative. And, and we, they used to, the president used to kid us, audio men, about the, anything that he could think of. You know, where we, while we were asking him for a level, he would throw in a couple of kidding remarks. And we would back and forth. and. I enjoyed uh, working with uh, President Roosevelt. He was very, very, very easy to work with. And you could set his microphone level, and you very, very seldom had to touch it. It was just up there at 90, 100, all through his broadcast. His voice was very, very level and very, very good voice. Uh, uh, Gravel, you were with uh, uh, CBS when you did those. Yes, yes. Well, the network, we, uh, we worked for the network and the local station, too. And the local station was WTOP. Uh, and, well, yeah, or JSV, of course. They owned a local station at that time, so I worked for CBS. And JSV J JS became WTOP. When did, it, when did it become TOP? It became TOP in 1943. Uh, WJSV was uh, owned by a man named John S. Vance. That's where he got the JSV. And Mr. Vance bought the license from, uh, Brooklyn, from Brooklyn in New York, where they were on the air, that, and the call letters there were WTRC. And it was called the 20th Century Republican Club or something like that. They didn't have it very long, and so Mr. Vance bought it from Brooklyn and brought it down here. And when he brought it down here, he changed the call letters to WTFF. And that was down, and the, the station was down in Virginia. And after a year or so, he changed, it, he changed the call letters to WJSV, his initials. And of course, I don't know why he picked TFF first, but he did. So that, uh, that was the, uh, in 1932, CBS bought it from Mr. Vance, and we kept the call letters JSV till 1943, and that was when it was changed. Now, the reason it was changed was that they, we were at the top of the dial those days. 1500 was the top of the broadcast band. Now it's 16, and pretty soon it's going to be 17. But uh, so TOP w was a good call for the top of the dial. And so Dr. Stanton of CBS, we applied for TOP, and they said it was taken. So we found out it was a police station in Tiffin, Ohio, at WTOP, Tiffin, Ohio Police. So Dr. Stanton dealt with the police, and they finally said, okay, we'll give you the call, and which they did. Now, we, in, in return, we invited all, of, all the city officials and the mayor and the police chief, everybody down to Washington when we first used T.O.P. as the inaugural uh, ceremonies using T.O.P. Uh, you know, I think that was a very fashionable uh, expression at that time, too, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was. It was a song, You're the Top, yeah, remember? Yeah, You're yeah. the Cat's Banana yeah, or whatever. Well, and we, we had uh, somebody composed a little, a little a song for us 
this this is WTOP radio, the top at the spot at the spot at the top of your dial, and we had a we had a little trio which sang it, and we applied to, for the commission to use that as an official station break, but they wouldn't let us do it. Now look what you got. <laughs> wait, you mean wait, because why? You because it was singing? Yeah, but well, they wanted the they wanted the station break done enunciated clearly by an announcer. And they didn't want any any songs about it. So now, now you, half the time you don't you don't understand the guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, would you two reminisce a little about the people that you worked with at WTOP? Oh, I think gosh. that might be kind of fun and. Well, well Granny. Uh, yeah. Well, the things. first the first man with my boss was was Clyde Hunt. He was the vice president for Post Newsweek uh, uh, stations, and Post owned uh, uh, half a dozen stations at that time, I think. And then, uh, we, of course, we had, uh, uh, see, who did we have? Uh, uh, Walter Cronkite was one of them. Mm -hmm. He started at, at, at uh, W-O, the station originally was W-O-I-C. And when we bought the station, we changed it to W-T-O-P-T-V. And of course, the FM station was W-I-N-X-F-M. And then we changed that to W-T-O-P-F-M. And to follow on with the FM, we ran it for some 13 or 14 years, and we never made a dime out of it. And at, at that time, we, we decided that FM wasn't going anywhere, and it wasn't. Nobody was. <laughs> <laughs> if they waited a year or two later, they would have found out. I hate to bring this up, but Chuck was head yeah. of WTOP right. FM at the time. Right. You weren't you, Chuck? Right. With the young sound. You were yeah, the, the voice sound. of the young sound. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and Granny turned the transmitter off, and that's why we aren't there. You remember Bill Hedgepath then, don't oh, you? Oh, certainly, of course. I think he was a program director right. at that time. Right. And uh, so we, uh, we felt that... Uh, they ought to take another shot at it. So they sent me uh, out to, uh, to Bloomington, Illinois, and we bought that um, auto automation equipment. I, I think we paid like $25,000 for it. And that was in 1966 mm -hmm. when the commission said you could no longer simulcast. Mm -hmm. You've got to originate, I think it was four hours a day, mm -hmm. non-simulcast on FM. So I think we started at 6 o'clock in the evening and went till 10 or whatever and then signed off. But, automated uh, system. Yeah, we had an automated system. Uh, using the uh, Scully uh, uh, tape uh, playback machines and we had it was it was the station was controlled by a cartridge tape which we dialed in in the functions of the what we wanted the, each machine to play and for how long and that would run all evening wouldn't it just start it and that was it but Who it was, wasn't making any money Chuck no, right, exactly this. No, it wasn't. nobody was, nobody what they didn't have FM sets or what was it <laughs> that was one reason there weren't enough receivers right yeah. Uh, who were some of the engineers that you worked with there? I would just like to hear. <coughs> well, there there was Chester McGee, who used to be Gallagher's morning man. He used to play Gall Eddie Gallagher's records. There was Frank Green, who is no longer with us. And we had uh, Bernie Swandick was another one of our technicians. Edwin Laker, Ed Laker. And uh, uh, Hampton Allison was one. Oh, sure. uh, uh, brother, Lamar's brother. Lamar, and yeah. Lamar Allison, uh, they were brothers. And uh, Lewis Rice, Linwood McDonald, they were transmitter men. Mm -hmm. Buddy Below. Buddy Below was a transmitter man. He, we, we, Buddy came in with us. Uh, he worked for the Post on the FM, and when we took over FM, he came with the FM station. And we had Nelson Wilson, who was also yes. FM. And uh, my gosh, I, oh, that, that's well, my I don't mean the to moment. challenge you too much, but I just think it's kind of fun. They were yeah. all great guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, we, we had. We were fortunate. We had a very, very good engineering staff. And as I said before, every one of them had a license. And you had to have a license from the FCC to operate any kind of a transmitting equipment. And that was our, our first requirement that any technician who worked for TOP or JSV were required to have this radio telephone first class license. So we had 89 guys on the staff when we, when we moved in the broadcast house, each one of them had a license. Wow. 89 engineers. 89, yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, in that day, in those days, we had transmitter crews. We had seven men at the AM transmitter, seven men at the FM transmitter, and seven men at the television transmitter. Now, in 1952, we moved the FM station from Lee Highway in Virginia. We moved that transmitter into the television master control. So then we took that FM crew and we put them in the studios. We didn't hire any more men or we didn't lay anybody off. And that was one thing about our staff. Every technician that worked for us 
spent a lot of years there, and there was, we never had any anybody that had to, had to be fired or, or or messed up in any way. It just we had a very very good staff stayed with us all the time. And you still get together annually for. We a still year, get together you? out at uh, at the Thurmont uh, Cozy Inn every September, every October, and last year we had 118. Now this of course it doesn't this. Includes uh, other people too, uh, oh, like yeah. production people, and every, anybody who worked at TOP can come to these luncheons. And we have one every year. This, the last one, we, it was the seventh year we had these uh, get-togethers. Very, it was a lot of fun meeting these old people that you don't see except once a year. Are you uh, going to retire? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not How gonna... many years has it been, Granny? How many years? Fifty-seven years. I've been working for <laughs> WJSV WTOP. And what do you do now there? I'm an engineering consultant. I work on some of the of the engineering uh, devices, like uh, we we make uh, antenna measurements uh, to make sure that our pattern is in, is in tune. And uh, uh, I do other equipment measurements and uh, the the noise level in the station and the frequency response and uh, and we to make sure we have to maintain certain uh, requirements by the FCC and, and noise level and the frequency response. So well, I, for, from these discussions, I think you're qualified to answer my question. Is the so. announcer safe when lightning strikes the towel? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say uh, fairly so, unless the uh, announcer, unless the studio was in the same building with the uh, transmitter. But nothing comes through the wire. No, nothing does. Yeah. But <laughs> we may have to do it again. Oh, absolutely. But we've run out of time, and they're giving us the speed up sign. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Out of the Past. <laughs>